studying First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles at the same time. When we finish uh, Solomon, we're going to split the empire there with Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and then we're going to go into the prophets and we're going to look at the different kings and things that were there, and we're going to try to study each book in the Old Testament. We're going to spend a week or so on each book. Uh, Jonah, we could do it in one, probably in one session. Uh, different ones, uh, we can go through. Uh, Job, we're going to look at the Psalms, all of this, and we're just going to basically do a Bible survey on them. Now, that's what they do in the Bible in eight ages. It was a kind of a, an Old and New Testament survey is what it was. Now, if you have, how many of you have the, the book I wrote, Old and New Testament Survey? Nobody? Okay, well we did, we had that here, I don't know whether we have any more over there, but I'll get some more for you, alright? And uh, last week we, uh, we studied where the Shekinah glory came to the temple, when Pop Solomon built the temple, the Shekinah glory, alright? And uh, 2 Chronicles, the 7th chapter, verse, or chapter 7, 2 Chronicles, the 2nd chapter, chapter 7. It says, Now when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the house. Now this is a Shekinah glory. Now the word Shekinah is not found in the Bible. How many of you knew that? If you've been in my classes for a while, you, you know it. The word Shekinah is not found in the Bible. It is a, uh, a, it is a word that the Jews invented to describe the presence of God. And it is a feminine word. Um, there are two classes that I spe specifically did on the Shekinah glory. If you go to the website, uh, the, stuff, the word online ministry on the sermon audio, if you put in that little sermon bar up there, if you put in Shekinah, uh, it'll bring up the two sermons. One of them was in 1 John and one of them was in the Bible in 8 ages, probably about chapter 9 or 19 or something like that. I can't remember uh, what it was, but I go into it in depth. But basically, Shekinah is a feminine word which shows forth the, uh, the care and the nurture of God for His people. Alright? And the word El Shaddai is closely related to Shekinah. Okay? El Shaddai, it means God, literally, of the breast which God is our nourisher. It, it has the, uh, the word uh, Shaddai, comes from the word Shad, which means woman's breast, which a woman nurtures her child when it's born for the first uh, several months of its life, sometimes up to two years, basically. And uh, uh, it's showing God is our nurturer. And the word Shekinah is a feminine word, which shows the what we call maybe the feminine side of God, where he loves and cares for his people. Okay, that's why that the word El Shaddai. Now, El Shaddai means the all-powerful, doesn't it? But it's all-powerful, but also all-healing and all-nurturing. All right, we receive everything from him. And then said all the... And the priests could not enter into the house of the Lord because of the glory filled the Lord's house. Here we have the Shekinah. Now we've had this happen three times in the Bible. We've had the Shekinah glory come upon uh, the house of God three times in the Bible. And God said it to Moses, he said, I want you to build a tabernacle so I can dwell with my people, didn't he? And when the tabernacle was finished, over here we see the tabernacle. I probably ought to take that and put it up on the uh, camera here real quick. So they can see what, look over there to the, to the tabernacle. If you look up to the tabernacle, you will see that, let me zoom this in just a little bit. You'll see that cloud over the tabernacle. You see that cloud? And in that cloud is the Shekinah glory of God. All right? That's it. Now let's see if I can get my camera set back to where it's supposed to be. If it'll stay there. The old rascal's getting so worn out it wants to zoom in all the time. For some reason or other. Something gets caught up and it wants to zoom in. Shekinah glory right here. That's what 
is talking about. When Moses finished the tabernacle, the Shekinah glory came down upon it, the presence of God came in there, and said they could not minister for it. And then, in the New Testament times, we have something there in the book of Acts, but here we have it, and when God, or Solomon built the temple, the Shekinah glory came down and took possession of it. All right? And it filled the house of the Lord. And then in the New Testament period of time, in Matthew, uh, it starts off out there with Jesus going out and calling out his, his assembly there at the Sea of Galilee. He called them out. And uh, what was the first gifts placed in the church? What's the first gifts placed in the church? What was the first gift? Remember what it was? What? Apostles. Apostles. All right. And he placed, and that was during his ministry, wasn't it? It was born of the day of Pentecost. All right. So the Lord called his little assembly out during his ministry. And he told them before he left. Now he said, uh, I want you to stay here and wait for me here in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. And the power from on high was the Shekinah glory that came down and engulfed the church and took possession of the church and empowered the church, one, to write the Bible, the New Testament, as we know it. We had the Old Testament already, but we didn't have the New Testament. And the New Testament is full of doctrine in it. And in what language is the New Testament? Greek. The most definite language that you could ever possibly have. So if God wanted to put his instruction manual down here, this is your instruction manual of how to worship God today. All right? And uh, that Shekinah glory came down on that church in Jerusalem. Well, we know that that church would be scattered throughout. But today, the Shekinah glory is still in his true New Testament churches today. We're not talking about all of the uh, exciting, charismatic things that we see in churches today that talk about the the Holy Ghost falling upon them and falling upon individuals. The Holy Ghost is in God's churches, leading them into all truth. All right? Let's go on here. So we have many sacrifices offered in the fourth chapter, I mean the, in the seventh chapter from four through seven. We have the Feast of, De of Dedication from eight through uh, ten. And then we have a promise and a warning. Now this is extremely important. This promise and warning is extremely important, okay? Now, the promise and warning goes down through all the whole history of Israel. Promise now, let's so look at this. Where's that at, Jim? Maybe I'm off. Now, we're in, we're in the Second Chronicles, the seventh chapter, and starting with verse 11. Now, if you go back, you're going to find this is repeated. In 1 Kings, in the the 7th, the 8th, and the ninth chapters are, this is what we, th these books are written alike. It's like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, okay? Matthew, Mark, ma well, actually, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what we call synoptics. Synoptics means what? It means to see together. Seen, octo, all right? To see together. Ophthalmologist, all right, is the eye doctor in it. Seen, synoptics means they saw the same things together. Okay, they saw together. So now we have now in the in the uh, in the ninth chapter of First Kings and First and Second Chronicles and First and Second Kings are synoptics. Okay, you see things together. Now sometimes it misses something in one and says more in the other, just like Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Luke may say something that Mark didn't say. And then John is not a synoptic, did you know that? The Gospel of John stands alone. As I'm teaching on a Sunday afternoon, by the way, Marilyn made muffins for you today. They're up there and there's some coffee and everything. Um, where was I? <laughs> a synoptic. The synoptic. Uh, that Matthew, Mark, okay, and Luke. Okay, now John, John is totally Luke. different. Yeah. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are written. Matthew to the Jews, Mark to the Hamites, Luke to the Japhethites. We have the three races of mankind that we're studying in the 10th chapter of Genesis. Brother uh, uh, Dave, you've been there. We studied, we're going to do a little more than that if I can make it this afternoon. It's through this, this help of mine. It's a struggle just to get here. 
Matthew, Mark, and Luke are written to the three races of man. Matthew is written to the Jews, to the Shemites. Mark is written to the Hamites, all right? The servant. And then Luke is the son of man, which is the Japhethites, all right? And then John, it just like John takes God and just puts him right among mankind. It shows us the glory of God, okay? Now, let's get over here to uh, God's promises and warning. Second Chronicles 7 and 11. And uh, the same thing is written over there in 1 Kings uh, 9. Let's see. So, the best, Jim, you say? 1 uh, Kings 9, yeah. First, Second Kings, and Chronicles say the same thing, but different. Just yes. like Matthew, Mark. And yeah, it's yes, just like Matthew, Mark. First and Second, Joshua, Judges, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. Basically, a lot of that is a synoptic view. So, what it says in one of them, you will hear it later. And a lot of times, you'll if you're reading the whole Bible, if you went through Genesis through uh, Malachi, you would come along, you would see Joshua, Judges, First and Second Kings, and First and Second Chronicles, and they say, "Well, this is all saying it all over again." Yeah, it is. It's as like Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It repeats the same story. Okay, how many of you knew that? Well, yeah. Okay, today but I didn't know that the, the kings did so. I'm yeah, read same this. thing. So that's why I'm I'm going through this. We're going through both books. Okay. All right. We have the Shekinah glory. We have the yeah. Feast of dedica Dedication. And then in Second Chronicles, the 7th chapter and verse 11. Yes, Brett? What were the books that were compared to? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John are kind of compared to like uh, uh, Joshua, Judges, and First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles. First and Second Kings, that's why we're going in First Kings and Second Chronicles right now. They're saying we're the same thing. They say the same thing. It's a repeat. Okay? It just tells you a little more in one than it does in the other sometimes. Okay? Matthew uh, presents Jesus Christ as the Messiah King, the Jew. Mark as the servant. All right? Uh, Ham would be the servant of servants. In all reality, Ham would do probably the greatest... Ham was probably the greatest blessing to the human race of all the races. Now all three play a part, as you studied on, on a Sunday afternoon in the book of Genesis, 10th chapter. But Ham would could contribute more to the human race than any other people. The Japhethites would uh, were the intellectuals, but also in, in intellectualism, uh, sometimes it will go astray. See, Apostle Paul spoke hard against the intellectuals of his day, didn't he? And so did Jesus. Didn't he? All right? You have your high-flying uh, philosophies and everything else, and I bring to you the simplicity of the gospel. All right? And then we find out here in the Old Testament from right here, well, actually, if you go back to the flood and you come right in here to where you have the three races of mankind, from that time on here, the whole Old Testament is about the Shemites. Nothing. You don't even, I mean, it, it just mentions the Hamites and the Japhethites every now and then. But the whole Old Testament just turns from Ham and Japheth and just emphasizes the Shemites. What Shem means what in Hebrew? Brother, you're a Hebrew scholar now? Monument. Monument. Our name. Because through the Shemites... God would glorify His name. And who do we have in the world today are the that are the Shemites? Well, I think... Uh, who are the Shemites? Are David wrote to the Shemites? Well, yeah, definitely. Who are the Shemites? You need to come to Sunday afternoon, brother. Who are the Shemites? Who are the little religious caretakers in the world today, the, the sons of Shem? Who are they? They're fighting all the time. Israel? Israel and the, and the Arab nations. Both of them don't think about anything but God. God promised me this. And I'll fight to the last breath and the last heartbeat. And do they? Yeah. Oh, you think you're ever going to whoop Israel? You think you're ever going to whoop the Muslim world? If you think you are, you're mistaken. 
it's going to take the Lord to do it. You're not going to do it. No man's going to do it. Okay? All right. The Shem, Shemites would be the Arab nations and would also be Jews. From this point in time on, the Shemites are mentioned in the Bible and the Shemites are there. I mean, every now and then we'll mention an old Dr. John. Right. Got fresh made muffins up there. The Shemites will be the main theme from here on. But over here at the cross, we find Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, how does Matthew look at Jesus? What? Shem. Mark. Ham. Luke. Japheth. All right. Now, the Lord is going to turn to the Japhethites to carry out the gospel because the Jews have rejected the Messiah. The Shemites basically take a back seat now. Jews are going to take a back seat because they have murdered their king. All right? And at the cross, let's look at this again. I don't want to repeat myself a lot, but I want you to get this. You've got to catch this. This is very important. Hold on, Brett. Who called for the crucifixion of Jesus? Jews. The Shemites. Who enforced the crucifixion of, the Jesus? of Jesus? Jews. Who? Jews. No. Who enforced him? They couldn't kill him. They had to call for some other, they had to call for a government to kill him. Romans? The Roman government, which is Jephthah. Who carried his cross to Calvary? A Hamlet. A Hamlet. That's right. There you've got Ham, Ham, Shem, and Jephthah right there. Now, during the church age, during the church age, the Jephthahites will take over. Am I scaring you too much for this? The, the, sentence, this? the sentence of Ham, Shem, and Jephat were all involved in Jesus' death. That's right. In some way. But, as always, the Hamites did the work. The Hamites founded the first and the greatest civilizations. They made every invention, basically, that's ever been made in the world. They were the greatest technological leaders in medicine, in surgery, in farming, in that, city building, the in the man. world. And say Africa, that's the black nation no. of Egypt. No. The Hamites. The Chinese. Oh, American Chinese. Indians. The Aborigines. Yeah. You want to learn something about medicine and nature, you go learn from an Aborigine. The furthest from the Fertile Crescent that you go, the more primitive the people will become. But they aren't primitive. They aren't just diggers. These people are brilliant. The American Indians were the greatest doctors in the world when the white man hit this country. They were living a long time, people. The Africans, the African nations, the Hamites, invented inoculation for smallpox. Did you know that? All of your first medicines and everything that did, all the first surgeries, postal systems, printed money. When Marco Polo went to China, he said, man alive, a Chinese guy can sell everything he's got in one province and move to another one, and all he's got to carry with him is one dollar bill. And he can go over there and buy everything he needs because all the prices are set for a chair, for a table, for clothes, whatever. He can sell his whole household and go over there without moving at all and go right over there and buy it. He said, we ought to take this printed money business up. That's a, I got the black The roads, the postal nation. systems, everything. That's who invented them. Okay. Now let's go back. I thought the black nation was the nation of inventors, Jim. What? I thought the black nation was the nation. The Hamites. But the, the blacks, the, the only certain part of the Hamites are black. Oh, okay. Not all Hamites are black. Oh, okay. American Indians are Hamites. The Aborigines are Hamites. All right? In India, they're Hamites. In America, they're Hamites. All right? China is Hamites. All right? Indonesia, all of those countries are all sons of Ham. All right? By the way, today, again, if you want the cheapest product in the world, where do you import it from? Mexico, Mexico China, <laughs> or Indonesia or something, okay? All right, that's the way it is. That's the backbone of the whole human race is the Hamites, as far as the workforce goes, all right? They would be a servant of servants, okay? Now, over here in the church age, let's look at that. We're kind of getting ahead, but I want you to understand what's going on here. 
the church age would be taken over by the Japhethites, the Gentile church. You know what happened? I go to the Gentiles. Who did God give the vision to? We're jumping ahead a little bit, but who got the vision to go to the Gentiles? Who got the vision? Paul? No. 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 Who got called to the Gentiles? Who, who baptized Jesus? By, well, hold on just a minute. I'm going to throw you a few hints out here. Who was called in a vision to go and baptize these unclean Gentiles? The first a Gentile church was established in Joppa. That was John. No. 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 Not Paul. No. Come on now. Brother David, do you remember who it is? Luke. But Dr. John, do you remember who it was? God showed him a tablecloth with all kinds yeah, of unclean animals who on it. Who was that? Come on. Joseph, Peter. do you know who that is? Who? Peter. Peter. Thank you, young lady. Oh. You get an A plus for today. Teacher's oh. pet. <laughs> a plus. That's Peter. We run out of names. Peter. Now, by the way, Peter was a Gentile to the Jews, wasn't he? But God wanted to teach the Jews a lesson. He said, he showed him this tablecloth coming down, and he said, all kinds of unclean beasts on it, and he said, arise, slay and eat. He said, no way. Nothing unclean or, or unkosher or common ever passed my lips. He said, arise and slay. Don't you call uncommon and unclean what I have cleaned. But he's talking about the Gentiles. Now get down there at Joppa and baptize them. Gentiles. Take the church representatives with you, and that's what he did, and go down there by church authority and establish it, baptize those people and establish a church. And that's what he did. We find out in the church age that the church will become a... Uh, the Japhethites are basically capitalist, okay? And the church will become a capitalist church in the end times. And the end of that, the full fruition of that church will be what? What's the end? What's the last church age? Right now. What is it called in the book of Revelation? Church. It's the age of what? Church age. No. It's a church. We're in church age, all right, but what is it? When the church becomes like the world and thinks it's rich. The Laodicea and church age. Laos, Ikea. The two Greek words. People justice. They will do what is right in their eyes. They will justify everything that they are doing. They will rewrite the Bible and make new rules. It's not that, that yeah, like not in God's eyes, but their yeah. eyes. And then the full fruition of this government is what? Babylon. Babylon the Great. After the true New Testament church is taken out, and all believers are taken out, then we form a what? We form Babylon the Great, which Babylon the Great is also the money center of the world. That's us. That's it. We're the Babylon. Yep, that's right. Babylon the Great will be, and then Babylon the Great is going to be destroyed by God. All right, but it's, it's going to be. But it tells that in the church age. So we see all of this. There's still the, the tribulation is a thousand years, though, right? Huh? The tribulation is a thousand years. No, the tribulation is seven years over here. For okay, seven well, years, then, uh, for the first three and a half years, we're going to have peace. All right. Did you know that the Muslims' idea of peace and, and the second coming and the tribulation period and everything is exactly like the Bible? They're looking for their Imam to come. He's going to bring in peace. He's going to bring in world peace and everything else. And of course, you know, the Jews are looking for their Messiah also. And he's going to bring peace. And what is he going to do? What is the one thing that the Jewish Messiah, according to them, is going to do for them? Bring them all together? Wow. Oh, come on now. I told you this before. Now you're supposed to know this. He's going to build them a what? A temple. A temple. He's going to build them a temple. How do you think they, why do you think they liked Herod so much? He built them a fancy temple, a greater temple than Solomon's. Now let's look at the warning. Let's look at the warnings here. In uh, 2 Chronicles, the 7th chapter, and starting with verse 11. The warnings. Now this goes for the whole rest of the whole age. Okay, so the, the restoration of Israel is a thousand years in, right? Yeah, this is when Israel 
what the tribulation period is for is to bring Israel back to God. And that's when the, well, that's when the Muslims will... The over. church becomes corrupt. God raptures all of the true believers and his churches. And the Muslims will take over, the Muslims will take over Israel, right? No. They won't? They won't no. invade there? We end the, in, in the book of Revelation, we find out that the person, this is, this is all taken up. The, the world's going to choose sides. There's going to be a Muslim world, which basically are all the African nations. We're not talking about black people now. We're talking about Muslim. I know. We're going to be, we're going to have China. And who's the other player? Iran, I don't know. China. Well, Iran's part of the, the uh, Muslim nations. We're going to have a Muslim world. Okay, all the Muslim world. Black, red and white, whatever. Okay? In all the Middle East except for All the whole Muslim world is going to be together and we're going to have China. And who is the other player there in this end times thing? India. Russia. Russia. Who? Russia. Russia, thank you, young guy. You get A plus now. All right, Russia. That's what's going to happen. But the first part of this is going to be peaceful. Israel is going to have their temple in Jerusalem. Everything else is going to go along right. I don't know how all this is going to happen. I think this is probably what Brother Ferrari used to call the, uh, the, the binding of the terrors, false religion, because this is Babylon, isn't it? The binding of the terrors, okay? And uh, during this period of time, how do we get over here, Brett? That's it. <laughs> anyway, for the first three and a half years, we're going to have some peace. But in, in, the, in the very middle of that week, the three and a half years to the day, the Antichrist stands up and he swears that he is God. And the Jews, he said, when you see this happen, flee from by the, the roadway of the mountaintops, the highway of the mountain, of the rooftops. Get out of here. Don't if you're on top of your balcony in your house, jump off the balcony and leave. Run to Petra. Get out of here because this is the abomination of the desolation. Alright? When he stood in the holy place and swore that he was God. So the Jews will take off. There's going to be at least 144,000 Jews saved. Okay? But God's going to protect the Jews from the middle of the week to the last of the week. We're going to have a terrible war in there. And that's when we have all those nations lined up against each other. Okay? All right. Now let's go back to 2 Chronicles, the 11th chapter. Uh, Dr. John, verse number 11. Second seven, chapter. 7 and 11. 2 seven. Chronicles 7 and 11. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house, and Solomon successfully accomplished all that came into his heart to make in the house of the Lord and in his own house. Okay, now we have a revelation to Solomon. And remember, I've told you this before. How does God appear to these people? What do we call the word today? What's the medical term for this revelation? Say it again. Huh? What is the medical term? All medical terms come from what? Like Latin. From Greek. Okay. All legal terms come from Latin. All medical terms come from Greek. I didn't study enough. <laughs> well, Dr. John. <laughs> all medical terms come from Greek. All legal terms come from Latin. Okay? The medical term for this, when God appeared to somebody, he usually appeared to them in a hypnosis. Do you know that in South America and in, in Egypt and in India and in different parts of the world that they were hypnotizing people Seven. and doing operations on them as a as a as an anesthetic? Did you know that, Doctor? You knew that. They were hypnotizing people. Well, God, when He put Adam to sleep in the Garden of Eden, He said He hypnosed. This is a Greek word. He hypnotized him. Okay. Now, right here, now He He deals with Solomon in a hypnotic trance. Hypnosis. All right? Number 12. Brett, are you there? Yes. If you, are you reading a good translation or something? I got uh, one that uh, SB gave me. Okay, good. That's better. Okay. The Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as temple for sacrifices. All right, that's good. That's a house of sacrifice. All right, Dr. John, number 13. When I shut up heaven, and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if okay, my... Now, that, now pay attention. 
Now, God's promises, now is this promise, does it hold true all the way through the whole history of Israel from this point of time on? Does this hold true? Well, yeah. This the whole Old Testament is about this, about this threat and promise. This is a threat and a promise. Okay, go ahead, brother. Okay, or send pestilence among my people. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, did he do this all over and over and over again? The whole Old Testament is a type of success and failure. A success when God judged them and failure when God healed them. And that's what he's promising here now. This is a conditional covenant. This is a conditional covenant, isn't it? A conditional covenant means it's when somebody makes an agreement and both parties agree. The Davidic throne is not a conditional covenant. Think about that. The Davidic throne is not a conditional covenant. It's on God's part only. No matter what happens, he says, there will not be a lawgiver cease from between the knees of Jacob. Never. Because the final king that was set on the throne of Israel was who? Jesus was of the seed of who? David. David. All of that happened because David would be on the throne, but Jesus was going to be a descendant of David. All right? Now, Mary and Joseph were both descendants of David. David. Both of them. In the book of Matthew, you see Joseph's lineage. In the book of Luke, you see Mary's lineage. Alright? But Jesus didn't come through Joseph's lineage. He inherited the throne through Joseph's lineage, but he was a physical son of the woman, of the seed of the woman, Genesis 3.15. Okay? Number 15 now, Brother Bill. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. All right. Now in the in the in the church age, where is the altar of incense in the church age? The the tabernacle typifies the church age. The holy place is the church. If you want to get real serious with God with your prayers, go to church and pray. Go to church and pray as an assembly. Okay? The church is not the building. All right? It is an assembly of people. The church is the ecclesia. All right, Brother David. Where did we end up? I just read 15. 15. 16. Number 16, David. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house, that my name may be there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. All right? In the tabernacle, God was there. And he dwelt with them. In the temple, he was there and dwelt with them until the Shekinah glory left him. And in the church, the Lord, his Shekinah glory is going to be in true New Testament churches all the way through to the end of the church age. Okay? And then the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the one that leads his churches into all truth. There are many churches in the world that have some truth, but God's churches have the truth. All right, number 17, Joanne. As for you, if you follow me as your father David did and obey all my commands, laws, and regulations, then I will not let anyone take away your throne. This is the same promise I gave your father David when I said you will never fail to have a successor who rules over Israel. Okay. Now, he did make a, a promise to David, but it wasn't the same promise. The promise that he made to David was irrevocable and unconditional. The promise that he makes with Solomon now. Of course, the lineage through Solomon would be a, would be firm because it would go through Solomon, wouldn't it? Joseph was a descendant of Solomon. Mary was not. Did you know that? Hmm. She was through another, another son. Hmm. Why? Because Solomon turned from God. All right, number 19, Dr. John. Oh, you got it. Okay. Thank you for being here. We sure missed you. Hey, I had a good vacation, though. All right, that's good.
Number 19, Joanne, God, Brett, you want to do that, Brett? If you turn away and forsake the decrees and commands I have given you, and go off and serve other gods and worship them, I will uproot Israel from my land, which I have given them, and I will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. I will make it a byword, an object of ready fool, among all peoples. And though this temple is now so imposing on all who pass, I will be appalled and say, why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and to this temple? Okay, hold on right there. It will be that way, won't it? And it was that way. You ever see uh, churches rise and fall in church history? Just think about this for just a minute. You can go and see Catholic churches that are five or six hundred years old. You know that? How many Baptist churches do you see that for? Probably none. Not very many. Why? Because they got caught up with the world. The Catholic Church was never part of God. So you don't have to worry about that. That is a materialistic, a total material. Catholicism is a total materialistic religion. It has nothing to do with God. So the buildings will stand and they will control the people. Isn't that the way it is? Just remember, just remember. Now here we have a total Japhethetic society. All right. A total change of that. The total control. Right. Why, okay, what is the Muslims uh, taking over the Christian temple? What is, it, what is how does that connect? Like, what, is what are it, you talking about? Like, okay, the Dome of the Rock. It used to be a Christian place, right? It used to be a Christian. No. There used to be a Christian church there. Yeah, no. Well, Jewish. there was the Zion Mount. Zion, there was a, a church. They didn't have a church there where the, the Dome of the Rock is. It was over there where Zion, on Mount Zion. Okay. You're saying it's a little farther away? Yeah, a little further away. But they built that, what was it, about 600 and something A.D. is when that thing was built. But the land don't mean much. But that's where they said that Saul that's was, where, and their person sacrificed, right? Is that true? What? They sacrificed, uh, Abraham sacrificed. That's supposed to be where that uh, uh, Mohammed had a vision. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. Uh, he was born in Mecca, which you're not going to get to go there at all. You, if you want to, if you want to know who our greatest enemy is, it is Saudi Arabia. You go over there, and you cannot live a lie. You walk into Mecca, you're a dead man. Did you know that? Uh -huh. You walk into Mecca, you're a dead man. What? You want to die? Go to Mecca. <laughs> you won't be alive. I can guarantee you that. Okay. I've been into the Dome of the Rock. How many of you been into the Dome of the Rock? I've been there. I've been right there in that area. I've been in Abraham's tomb. Now that's a sacred place, boy, Abraham's tomb. I'll tell you, that's where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are buried. That's weird. That's weird when you walk into there, boy. I mean, this is something else. You can't even go there. So the Christian temple was built a little farther away. Well, it, remember what I said? The church is not a house. It's not a building. It's not a location. It is an assembly. No, I realize that, but I'm just saying. I think but the materialistic, but materialistically, you can go back and you can find a Catholic church at the Howland Year yeah. Noble because that's a materialistic church. Yeah. That's the reason they own the... the, the but people the, live the, and die. America. That's right. That, that, well, the Vatican is... I think he, what he's getting mixed up is is, is they built... The, the, the Muslim built the temple where, where, where Solomon built his, his uh, temple. That's they what he's talking about. Solomon uh, basically in some, near the temple of... Or that's near the temple where the temple of Solomon was. If you ask the Jew, if you ask the Muslim today, they'll swear that Talmud Solomon's temple was never there. Did you know that? Yeah. yeah. They they'll swear that it never happened. They, they swear that David was never a real character. They him Can you imagine that? He never existed. They, your, your namesake never existed. And Solomon never existed. That's just a, a fairy tale as far as they're concerned. And the whole city of Jerusalem was never anything, according to the Muslim world. Okay? They just deny it all. And they, that's, they, if they deny it, then, they, then the Jews have no right to build a temple there. Okay? Why do they want but don't so worry bad? about the material. But why do they want the land so bad if they don't care? Because it's the place where God would put his name and God, Israel will have a temple there. And that's where they will go during the thousand year reign. They're going to have at least a, feet, a thousand feasts of tabernacle there in Jerusalem. Okay? At that time. But that's where he made his temple. But who denied it? 
when Israel rejected their king, they lost it, people. And they ain't going to get it back. You mean Jesus, right? America is not going to win it back for them. Russia couldn't do it. Nobody is going to win that land back for them. Jesus is going to have to give it back. Yeah, God's so, got to give it back. And he says that and in the 42nd chapter. he's going to take it over. Yeah, he says that in the 42nd There's chapter. There's going to be a false messiah come on the, on the scene, and he's going to build them a temple there. Okay? We keep getting over here out of it, this book. But in the 42nd okay. chapter of Ezekiel, it tells you that God says that he'll give it back to them. Not because they deserve it, but for his name's sake. Yeah, because, because of the promise. People will know that he's God. Yeah. Well, who's going to have control of that for the last three and a half years of that tribulation period? The false Messiah. He's going to run Israel out of Jerusalem. They won't be there at all. Saying, I'm going to tell you out. something. Now, let, 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 me, let me tell you one fantastic little revelation here, okay? If you ever see Israel take control of the city, old city of Jerusalem, look up or your redemption draws nigh. I guarantee you. When it Jews, when the Jews take control of the old city of Jerusalem in that temple area, it's real close. You mean the Dome of the Rock? You mean, or that's that's right. Where the city of Israel fought and won the city of Jerusalem. What was it? 1968 because they wouldn't they give it to somebody else? I don't know. God wasn't ready. If they would have taken the Mosque of Omar, if they would have taken the city of that, they would have had all of those those Arab nations yeah. all over the world right down their throats instantly. Yeah. That's what one of the Jewish generals said. They asked why right. he didn't take it. He Moshe said, Diane. We can't go in there, boys. Yeah. Best we can do is go over there to the Wailing Wall where Solomon stuck it temple stones for the retaining wall. They can't go in there. Did you know that? The Jews don't go into the whole city of Jerusalem. Because they're, they they're, can't go there. They're scared of the Arabs or what? No. It will unite the Arabs. It will unite the Arabs and there will be the Armageddon. Oh, that's the reason the general okay. said they asked the general why he got over Megiddo. Moshe right? Diane, he said, I don't want to start World War III. Yeah. They could have gone in and done it. But they were there. War, the war would not have been over. He, they whooped the socks off of those people and they took that. They I'm going to tell you, that was a battle. Huh? That was a battle, not a war. Yeah. They actually they would have started a war that they couldn't win if they'd have gone in Jerusalem. That's gone now. We're getting too far ahead. God, I'm right. good, Jim. But it's this. Good. Good. Yeah. Well, it's, it's good. You're learning some things. All right. Okay. 22. 22. Verse number 22, David. People will answer, because they have forsaken the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of Egypt, and have embraced other gods, worshiping and serving them. That is why he brought all this disaster on them. All right. Now in chapter 8 there, we have a, all of Solomon's accomplishments, which don't mean the hill of beans. Nothing. But you know what it did to him? You know what Solomon's riches did to him? Huh? It destroyed him. It destroyed him. Solomon's riches destroyed him. In the Bible, the whole Old Testament law was set up to keep the rich from getting richer. They taxed them so bad that they couldn't get super rich. Okay? It kept one man from stepping on the other man. That's what it did. And the uh, and that's what we have here. We have and when Israel asked for a king, what did God warn them and say? You don't want to be a king. 
You don't want a cannon. What, what's it going to do to you, Brett? He's going to make you like other people. You know, no, he's going to make slaves out of you. Oh, okay. He's going to have super wealth and you're going to be super poor. We're going to have a prince in the land. All of Europe is a history of princes and paupers. Did you know that? Yep. That's all it is. Serfs and kings. That's all of Israel. I mean all of Europe. That's the whole history of it. And verse number 11, 8 and verse number 11. Read that one, Brother uh, uh, Bill. 8 and 11? Uh-huh. Now Solomon brought the daughter of Pharaoh up from the city of David to the house he had built for her. For he said, My wife shall not dwell in the house of David, king of Israel, because the places to which the ark of the Lord has come are holy. All right, well, he didn't want this... He didn't want a Gentile there. Uh, well, she was a Hamite and a uh, basically a, a unbeliever, so to speak. Unbelievers do not belong in God's churches, do they? They get there, don't they? You know what you have with the, the Catholic Church? You got a whole bunch of unbelievers running the church. Non-believers. You got a whole bunch of materialistic people running the church. You know, they, those Catholic people are wonderful religious people, the people. When you go, you want to see order and complete control, you go into a Catholic church to do a funeral or a mass. And when that priest says something, I mean they jump. Boy, isn't that something? If I could stand up here, you Baptist, and say something and you jump. <laughs> yeah, do it. You know? But they do. I mean, everybody's doing it all in unison. Total control. It is a materialistic church. Now these people are doing it with all their heart. They're scared. They're doing it by way of fear. The priests are doing it by way of control. Alright? Now let's go over here to chapter 9. Chapter 9. Okay? And in... Uh, then we're going to go back in the First Kings chapter 11. Chapter 9, let's read this. Uh, uh, Joanne. When the Queen of Sheba heard of Solomon's reputation, she came to Jerusalem to test him with hard questions. She arrived with a large group of attendants and a great caravan of camels loaded with spices, huge quantities of gold and precious jewels. When she met with Solomon, they talked about everything she had on her mind. Solomon answered all her questions. Nothing was too hard for him to explain to her. When the Queen of Sheba realized how wise Solomon was, and when she saw the palace he had built, she was breathless. All right, hold it right there. She was breathless. She was in love. She was in love, brother. She was in love. Anna. Anna. Ours number five. She was breathless. She was in love. She was all right. also amazed at the food on his tables, the organization of his officials, and their splendid clothing, the cupbearers and their robes, and the burnt offering Solomon made at the temple of the Lord. She explained to the king, everything I heard in my country about you, about your achievements and wisdom is true. I didn't believe what was said until I arrived here and saw it with my own eyes. In fact, I had not heard the half of your great wisdom. It is by far, it is far beyond what I was told. Okay, and verse number eight, is that where you're at right seven. now? Oh, seven. Okay, verse number seven. Now, she becomes a believer. By the way, did you know that when the Queen of Sheba, now she, she made love to Solomon. She got pregnant. She went back into her nation where she came from. She had a child, and they set up a, a tabernacle and temple worship there that replicated this. Uh, there was a say a, I can't remember the name of the guy traced himself right back to Solomon in, in basically in Africa where Sheba was but they had a, a false worship down there, well not a false but a duplicate worship down there and they were actually black Jews okay and we, we see them when we looked at the lost ten tribes, you know the deal about that. Actually, they weren't lost. They've never been lost. 
you know, but it told where they were coming from in China, some of them were there, and all different parts of the world, and Africa and everything. And they, and supposedly they still have that Ark of the Covenant down there. And of course some of this media and some of these speculators say, oh, she was so smart that she substituted her replicate, her duplicate of the Ark of the Covenant and took the real one down there. Now that's one of some of the stories that they tell, and that's the story you hear about down in, in uh, Ethiopia or Africa there where the Ark of the Covenant is. That's the story, the legend behind that. It did go back to Solomon, but it's not the real one. The real one was still there, and God told Jeremiah to go down there and take the, the, the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle and all of it and hide it in the mountain where God showed Israel the promised land. Okay, so here, here we are now. We, throw, we took care of that legend while we're here. Okay? All right. Number uh, seven there, uh, uh, Anna. Oh, how happy your people must be. What a privilege for your officials to stand here day after day listening to your wisdom. Okay, now, the word happy there is Baruch. Blessed. How blessed are your people, Baruch. How blessed are your people. All right? Number eight. Praise the Lord your God who delights in you and has placed you on the throne as king to rule for them. So now she's blessing uh, Jehovah, isn't she? Mm -hmm. All right. Because God loves Israel and desires his kingdom to last forever, he has made you king over them so you can rule with justice and righteousness. Now she gives an offering from 9 uh, on to verse 11. And, and all the different things she tells what all she gave to the king and all kinds of offerings she gave to him and, and uh, uh, anyway uh, the things that she gave to Solomon and then verse number 12 this is very important I'm going to let uh, a lady read this this is a, a this is a this is a love story uh, Joanne King Solomon gave the Queen of Sheba whatever she asked for alright in Hebrew it says her desire Remember, well, she fell in love with him. Now he's going to give him her desire. She gives, he gives her a child. All right. He marries her too. But she takes back off and, and is a queen of Sheba. Go ahead. King Solomon gave the queen of Sheba whatever she asked for, gifts of greater value than the gifts she had given him. Then she and all her attendants left and returned to their own land. Okay, now in verse number 13 on, we find uh, uh, Solomon's great wealth and power, which doesn't mean a hill of beans. What happened to it? When he died, he went to the four winds. Didn't that mean nothing? What you have in this world means nothing. What you do for the Lord means everything. Now go back to 1 Kings, the 11th chapter, Brother David. 1 Kings 11 and 1. Now we see the downfall of a great wise man. A great wise man. Brother David, 11 verse 1. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughters, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites. Now what did you do? He loved these women. How many wives did he have? It says he had 700 wives and 300 concubines, but how many wives did he actually have? 3,000. He had 1,000. Joseph, you want misery? <laughs> I don't even want to think about it. <laughs> you want misery? You have 1,000 wives. You want something to lead you away from God? You have 1,000 wives. Joanne, I, you kept this man in, li in line for a long time. How many years? <laughs> I don't know. Forty-two. Forty-two years. Maybe this December. All right. Now, Bill, I'm going to tell you something. If you had 999 more, you'd have had a lot of trouble. No, I would not kill myself. <laughs> what did these women do? The Edomite, the Sidonians, and the Hittite women. The Hittites, basically, are Chinese. Did you know that? The Hittites are Chinese. That's where they founded Cathay. Alright. Number two, Brother David. 
They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, You must not intermarry with them, because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. Oh, he held fast to them in love. Oh, boy. Now, read it, Brother Bill. Read it and weep. <laughs> Number three. I probably fall through this. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wife turned away his heart. That's not good. That's a thousand women, a thousand wives. Every one of them now, they weren't his wives until they were consummated. He was with all of them. A thousand. A thousand of them. That's a lot of women. I, I, you know a what? Lot of women. Did, 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 he, did he have names for them or did he number them? I don't really remember. I, well, I, Joseph Smith couldn't remember all of his wives. He could bring, bring them young. He said, hey, uh, 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 I have trouble remembering Marilyn's name. Don't tell her that. <laughs> <laughs> number four now. Number four, Brett. Number four and eight. That's sec, sec, First Kings 11 and verse number four. Well, I'm getting close. Okay. Joseph, are you there? Anna, are you there? Which one? Number four? Anna, F four. In Solomon's old age, they turned his heart to worship other gods instead of being completely faithful to the Lord his God as his father, David. Finn. All right, now there's where we're going to quit. It's time to quit today, and we're going to go right back there next week. That's where we're going to go. Now, we went from a great man to a, uh, a flop, didn't we? A great man to a flaw. It was all. It was all founded upon a materialistic society, wasn't it? Democrats. You know, he built one. He built one temple to God. How many did he build to false gods? Many. Many. The temple that he built to God was what? By inspiration. The temple that he built for his wives was by lust. Have inspiration and we have lust. All right. Well, let's have a prayer and go out and do something eternal this week. And uh, Brother Bill, are you going to do this? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we got a roundup Sunday coming up. You guys don't want to to forget that. And uh, gather all your parts. We need to make a big.